Hello, everyone that's here. Um, first, I want to welcome everyone to our second episode of Out of the Woods, a Cyber Security's Threat Hunting Podcast. Um, this is aimed to cover threat hunting, burning topics, security burning topics, everything threat hunting, stuff you might want to know about. Um, just as a reminder, throughout the podcast, we'll be taking comments and questions from our Discord server. So if you want to participate, make sure to sign up using the link in the welcome message. Uh, we'll also be throwing things as we discuss uh, certain topics in there as well. Uh, if you wanted a copy, paste, have a copy, view, that kind of stuff. Um, so moving on, I'll well, introduce myself. For those that don't know me, I'm Scott Poley. Uh, obviously work at Cyborg, um, doing threat hunting and some content development stuff. Uh, you can check out me, you can check me out on LinkedIn uh, if you want to kind of get a view of kind of what I've done, what my background is and kind of expertise. Um, just kind of a myriad of things uh, I like to kind of dabble. So um, that's me, and I'll hand it over to Mike to introduce himself. Yep. Hey, everybody. I'm Mike. Um, clearly, work at Cyborg as well. Uh, really focused on engineering, architecture, kind of products, and then, you know, all things sales. So um, really help support the threat hunting team as we start to, you know, publish what we do to our platform and, and give them a place that they can go break things and, and learn the net new tools and vulnerabilities and malware. So really looking forward to today's podcast. So also, just so everyone knows, uh, we always feature a cocktail recipe made by our team. Um, so if you want to participate, the recipe is associated with um, signing up with this podcast or this episode specifically. Um, you give it a try, leave your feedback. It's always fun to kind of see where we hit it, where we don't. Um, also, we're really excited to announce that the Out of the Woods um, podcast is now available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and just about everywhere else you get your podcasts. So please subscribe and and try not to miss another threat hunting episode. Um, so now we'll kind of dive in. So how we typically format um, our discussion points, uh, we usually pick some you know five top stories that kind of hit the radar. Um, and we'll kind of dive into those. Uh, so that's what we'll do next. So I'm gonna introduce the first one. I'm sure everyone's heard of the you know Git GIF shell uh, associated with the Microsoft Teams. Um, for those that have not seen it, this is kind of the article that, you know, is the one we're going to reference, but there's some other material we'll go on. So, Mike, um, with you checking this out, what were your initial thoughts? So, I think we were we were fairly early on using Office 365 and Teams at Cyborg specifically. So, we've seen the iteration of this platform for the past three years. And one of the really interesting things that I caught early on as an admin and engineer is that um, the the kind of the implementation of their GIFs, right? Um, they use Giphy as a source. So if you if you attach a GIF, you're reaching out to Giphy, pulling those GIFs into Teams. Now there are some administrative capabilities where you can block access, you can turn it off completely, um, but it was really interesting reading this article that Microsoft kind of came out and said, this isn't bypassing our security protocols. I mean, but clearly there is a, a very novel way to exploit teams for lateral movement. Um, I think it mentioned a number of the different tactics and techniques that this allows it, a, a potential malicious actor to use. Um, you know, I think it, it seems like a novel approach to lateral movement. And Scott, I want to get your, your feedback on that, where you know, they set up this article to say, yeah, Teams is exploitable, but I think you have to have a stager already deployed on the victim's machine, and there has to be an entry point for you to exploit this. So a lot of yeah. times those titles gloss over that, but I think once you get into the article, it's, it's a little bit more detailed than just Teams is exploitable, right? Yeah, I was looking at, um, for those that aren't aware, you know, it seems like the pattern is really... Uh a way for some external person to send a message and that's kind of like their like social engineering phishing attempt to get them to basically run the stager as, as it's referred to as and the stager is actually what's controlling that c2 communication and it's right. leveraging gifts and base 64 encoded data in those gifts to kind of um facilitate that communication um so so yeah you have to have that initial stager you have to fall for that first piece for the other pieces to kind of fall in place um, yeah, so one of the things I was looking at, I'm going to move this over back to Discord. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the URL pattern, um, obviously it uses kind of Skype and I'll throw the pattern in here. 
Um, actually, let me get more of the details so it's not just like random looking link um, in Discord. So in Discord, I'm throwing up there kind of the, is it showing it as a PNG? Of course it is. Um, but it's the URL pattern um, for how the GIF's being fetched, right? And what, what's good to know is it's basically you can see what the pattern looks like if it's Skype. Um, Dot com. That's kind of what that looks like. You've got the base 64 encoded data that's on the GIF. And it, if you're going to be doing C2 communication, um, these are going to have to be fetched pretty frequently. So just looking at kind of that volume in itself um, can kind of kind of key you off of, hey, there's something going on that, you know, at least looks like this now that we know about this, but it'd be highly suspicious. And one of the things to note, I'm hoping it'll let me copy the text this time. And as you're adding that in, I think in the article it actually called out that the URL doesn't, you know, initially look suspicious because it's using the already established infrastructure for Microsoft. Right. So I, I think to your point on the anomalous traffic, that's a really good place to start looking for this type of threat rather than just relying on that indicator of compromise, right? If there was an actual C2 call out. Yeah, and the... Um... And so the, one of the things that was interesting with the uh, response data, it seems like all the response stuff was base 64 encoded in the name of the gift going back. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't actually part of like, you know, when they did the byte manipulation to add the base 64, you can send gifts base 64. Um, right. So that being said too, you know, just looking at the pattern. So I got to figure out a better clipboard to put these things into so I can copy them out. But something that I think is um, helpful is, the regex pattern, right? Like that regex pattern is basically looking for um, any file name that has base64 named, you know, dot gif. Um, so you can kind of see if, depending on what tool sets you're using, if you can see when there's like tons of file creates or, you know, things like that, that's something you can kind of look for as well. Um, so one of the other things too um, is how they were manipulating uh, people or how the example he was showing how you can masquerade sending that stager in mm -hmm. an example they had was basically like picture name dot jpeg and then a bunch of dots before it gets yeah. to the exe and it, what it what it did was make that not visible as an exe so you can kind of get people to click thinking oh it's a picture i want to see or whatever um sure. I, it was funny i tried to recreate this on in the mac using their teams there and it it didn't have any display issues where it hit anything. I can see exactly what was being sent. So I don't know if it's just a Windows thing. I didn't go, you know, too far to dig into that specifically. Were you trying to name, were you just naming a file with that, that dot extension, you know, expanded out? Yeah, I did it with yeah. a PDF. I was basically, yeah. I made the PDF look like a JPEG and see if I can just send a you know, PDF to myself. Um, and it showed so, the full path. So um, it might happen during the, the processing of that JSON blob that's typically sent in those messages, like if I were to use the API and send that JSON blob, it might be something with that processing that cuts that off. Oh, that's it true. It was using the raw JSON yeah. when they were sending that stuff. So you're probably yeah. right there. Exactly. Um, so one of the things that, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, well I was gonna say the one thing that, you know, when I was looking at, if you were to run something like that, it seems like most things you open via Teams, right? It's gonna go to the user's mm -hmm. default download. Mm -hmm. So if it, if it keeps that same extension pattern, um, sure. Then you can look for some weird things like that too. Um, and so something that I I typically do once I get past this article, I'll try to find a different text editor. So I'm not doing a bunch of image based pace. Um, and we'll see this up after the after the podcast and make sure we share this out as well. Yeah. So this is like if I'm looking for an executable, you know, and it's on a path, right? And if it's going to be a weird executable in a location that I think, you know, weird things might be run, like temp directories or you know, download folders I care about, I commonly look for the inverse of stuff. So if they want to use special weird characters, or other things that can try to throw off any kind of my pattern matching, I just say as long as it's not, you know, the path backslash delimiter and then ends in exe, um, it helps me identify those types of things. And then you can even get, you know a little more creative too, like if you're looking for multiple things, just what that looks like. Um, so that's something that would kind of help identify some of these things if you know or looking for or hunting for those, like, hey, we got things hitting the um, download folder being run um, kind of stuff. So um, that was kind of another takeaway, way to look at that. Um, and then the one thing I thought, you know, it's typical, right? There's that indexed DB directory associated with Teams and the app data roaming. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, low level log file. And apparently that's what the scraper is actually looking at, right? So the scraper is monitoring to that to see when GIF um, gets sent in so it know, or base64 GIFs get sent in so it knows to interact and do what it needs to do there. Sure. Um, um, so the, the one thing I know, you know, when I was thinking about that was it is very verbose, but if you actually have object handling enabled on, you know, Windows, for, for instance, you could basically look at the, you know, 4656 events um, and where the object name contains that path and some process is probably not teams. Like I haven't tested this myself. It's kind of just yeah. you know, conceptually how I thought about it, you know, but things I wouldn't expect to access that log file that are executing. Yeah. Um, yeah. An easy giveaway of like, hey, well, that's clearly not normal, but the, you're kind of asking for a lot of data to be able to solve that specific one. So, sure. uh, yeah, and and to your point on that parsable log file, I mean, Microsoft said that this isn't bypassing any security framework that they have in place for Teams, but for me, having a parsable log file associated with the organization and that kind of data that's typically passed back and forth in Teams, I feel like that's a really good place for a malicious actor to go look for, you know, IP, company secrets, passwords. Uh, you can kind of build an org chart off of that kind of data, right? So I know it's it's specific to that user, but that that might be the first place I go look for um, as you know, engineering teams sharing passwords, sharing files, uh, company documents. Like that's a that's an amazing place to go look for that kind of data. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, just seeing Raider post something for a CrowdStrike, one of the things um, that I didn't know, but I was looking at just the event simple names, they actually have a GIF file written, and I was kind of curious, you know, because if you're, like I said, if you're doing a lot of C2 over transmitting GIFs back and forth, um, there's going to be a lot of GIFs written, assuming that they're getting written in a way where CrowdStrike would see it. So um, that was something else I was thinking about for sheer volume. If you see, you know, GIF file written, um, do bucket it by time, you know, the count per host, you know, if it's greater than a certain amount, then you know there's kind of some trickery going on that could be associated with this. So kind of the logic I was thinking of. Are there any? Uh, go okay. ahead. No, there's there any, is there any potential, you know, big false positive there? Because we send a lot of gifts internally, right? Yeah, um, so the bucket of time now, is that going to hit hard and flag? Yeah, I would think the bucket would have to be narrow, right? So, you know, you're saying like, hey, there's a, a lot of gifts being sent within five seconds. If you have two or three gifts in five seconds from on the same machine kind of thing, you know, that might narrow that down where you might not catch every C2 communication, but you might catch that one surge. It's enough to alert you to start looking, stuff like that. So it's, you know, it's I, untested, just a, a thought on like, hey, if the data is there and it's, you know, it's something you can utilize and they, you know, attacks around this, that might be an interesting way to you know, look at it. So, um, so Absolutely. yeah, that was kind of, kind of but my I thoughts. I think to your, to your point, if you're hunting for this, oh my God, go ahead. No, you're good. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, I was saying, if you're going to hunt for this type of exploit, to your earlier point, it's really look at what processes are are trying to open those type of files outside of that that team's process, right? Um, that's a really good way to kind of narrow down that noise, um, just like Raider said, right? And as long as well as the bucket of time. So. Yeah. So I mean, interesting. I mean, the good thing is it's you know it's good research showing how people can manipulate commonly used things. Um, it didn't sound like it was something that was like being picked up and utilized, but. You know, I always worry like, okay, if I can social engineer someone to run an executable, what are some other files I can get them to run or rewrite a different type of stage or doing something different, right? So when every time I think of or see one of these attacks, I'm always thinking, well, this is now kind of publicly known, but how, if I was an attacker, would I use this type of technique to achieve something slightly different that is unique to me? So, but, but yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and then, you know, Riptide also posted about the clear text tokens that, that came out today. So it seems like when it rains, it pours. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> it seems <laughs> it like we should see some more information about that coming out, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that common um, trope in, in security. Like, we, we know all the, the hard things we try to solve and chase down, and then it's those easy things that always come back and get us, right? Um, so, so, yeah. Not unheard of. All right. So I think... Yeah, so not to beat a dead horse. I think we can tie that one up. Um, yeah. Appreciate the uh, the input on Discord as well. Um, so the next article 
is centered around uh, you know Android, specifically Android malware, but more kind of focused in on the mobile space. Um, and so Sharkbot malware kind of reappeared initially when Google Play rolled out. Um, you know they didn't do a lot of that proactive automated code scanning, so they did have some issues with malware very early on in the Play Store uh, rollout. But as they've got into the code signing and doing the automated code searching, as you publish to the Play Store, that has started to go away. But this is kind of a novel way that these actors are getting around it. So Scott, you, you know your takes on this one? I figured you'd be fearful since you're the Android user. But um, <laughs> yeah, the one the one thing I keep reading, and, and it's just funny, it's you know, as security professionals, we want to make everyone aware. And that's like the one thing, like the fear factor for cybersecurity is out there in the public. Like yep. people that don't know anything about cybersecurity, they're scared of it. And then all of a sudden we see all these social engineering things when it comes to getting things on your phone. Like people are downloading random AV apps that may be free because they want to better protect their stuff. And that ends up being the malware itself. Yep. Um, so it's kind of one of those things that's like, gosh, you know, like, you know, we try to do this awareness and then it almost feel like it makes people fall for things even worse. But um, the one good thing was the other version of this, you know, they were taking advantage of the accessibility service, yep. um, which allows them to actually download the real payload. So the stuff in the, the store wasn't actually malicious. It was more like what it did after you, you started running it. Um, and then Google changed that functionality. So now they doesn't have access to the accessibility service directly. It requires kind of a user interaction. So then they have to trick them further by saying, oh, update available, you know, click this to allow kind of thing, yep. which is good. Um, but yeah, it's just one of the, it's, it's one of those things that is kind of, I chuckle about how, you know, security sounding software is what's getting people. It's almost like if people just paid attention to what they do in general, they'd all around be safer. So, um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, um, having an Android, right? It yells at you anytime you need to turn on a service for an app. Like there's a lot of prompts. So it can it can kind of lull the end user to where, like if I'm using Waze and I need to turn on my GPS, location tracking, camera, you know, microphone, it's gonna yell at you and have you click yes, allow using app, yes, allow using app. So I could see how over time, maybe you've been an Android user for a year, you download this app, it's asking you to do something, you're like, yeah, whatever, and you just click the button, right? Um, yeah. I think they've gone a little bit further for the application services within this article. They were talking about how you really just need to, I guess for this to work, is to accept unsigned uh, APKs, which is basically sideloading you know, an application into the Android device. That takes a little bit of digging in the settings. That's not as easy as just clicking that prompt. So I feel like if you've, if you've bypassed that, um it's kind of on you right like there's a yeah, lot of steps yeah. to get to get um you know manipulated and hacked in, in this case right so it's a I'm, I'm curious to see the landscape of these type of attacks through the play store to get into these mobile devices um i, I know the the organizations in like google and apple are doing everything they can to protect the end user but i think the more you prompt and the more you give the human the ability to affect those services and those configuration changes it's going to kind of lull you into a sleep right you're going to get a little bit um uh, you're going to get used to hitting that button and then the next time an application you know prompts you you're not really thinking about the security you're thinking about the easy use and i just want to use this app right so yeah, it's kind of forcing the security on the weakest link already which is the human piece right yeah absolutely so, so yeah yeah, no, that's a that's a quick one. Um, yeah, I know you're an Apple guy, so <laughs> I'm not worried. No, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so this next one, um, I thought it was really interesting. So just so people were able to see it, it's you know the ransomware gang switching to new intermittent encryption tactic. Um, one, I think it's really cool, right? You know, they're thinking they're thinking along these lines. Like, you know, we don't have to. Like you can destroy something by barely destroying something, essentially, yep. right? Um, but you know, and then in ransomware, they operate with very little oversight. So you know, they're allowed to move as fast as they need to move in order to get to where they need to get to to execute their operation of encrypting as many things as possible. So it's just a, such a different attack. And you know, the one thing in ransomware is um, change is the landscape of dwell time, right? 
They move really fast, and this just kind of speeds them up even more, even though I don't think the encryption process is really slowing them down that much. Um, and plus, once they get to the encryption, it's kind of end game for the defenders. I always like think like, man, we, we focus so much on ransomware. Um, like, how do we detect ransomware? And it's like, well, gosh, like if I was getting hit by ransomware and I knew and I was, you know, the server rooms down the hallway, like, what am I going to do? Like, run down the hall and try to unplug the power? You know, like, I feel like yeah. if I'm seeing things being encrypted at that moment, it's kind of too late. Um, so, so in that, you know, mindset, it's like, okay, it, it's cool. They can speed up their encryption. Um, but that part's really not important. Um, because really you should be focusing on, you know, all the other things leading up to that. Right. So, you know, like how was access gained, you know, and then you, it's probably two different ways, right. It's going to be the remote access availability somewhere with either, you know, credentials, you know, they've scraped or used or phishing, right? So then it controls around that, you know, help or detections around that help. Uh, then almost every single time, unless they land in like the sugar pot, um, they're gonna be doing, you know, internal recon, lateral move at some point, um, trying to get to a position where they can actually, you know, one, if they try to exfil data before they encrypt. Um, so there might be, you know, typically we're seeing like our clone activity for that, right? Um, and then you have, uh, you know, them going for the DA and then basically trying to encrypt everything. So, you know, you, you have a couple different ways where you can kind of see that activity. Now, the bad news is, is it's, it takes them sometimes a week to two weeks to execute their entire operation, sure. um, which is very different from a target attack where they're not really looking at that specifically. I mean, it might be in their toolkit, but their dwell time is usually months to figure out exactly what kind of attack if they want to do something or special information or however they want to leverage where they're at in their access. You know, that's where the dwell times are, you know, six months to a year. No, um, if they're not caught. You so. see that change based on the type of organization. Now, if we're talking about a financial org, or we're talking about government, or you know, ICS, or you know, healthcare, right? Um, are they still going to take that same amount of time before they encrypt something um, and spend so, that time to do that lateral movement and that research within the environment? Or I feel are they like it hard. I feel like um, it's kind of probably a give and take because if you can't encrypt enough stuff, no one's going to care. Sure. So the larger the organization or the more dispersed the data potentially could be, um, they might the sit right there longer stuff. to try to go ahead. No, I'm saying, or the right stuff. It's not about all right, the, things, true. But right. the, the key items, right? Um, yeah. So th then it comes back to like, okay, if I found the right stuff and I can, you know, get everything encrypted that needs to be encrypted, I'm just going to run with it. And it's going to be as fast as I can possibly go. Cause there really is no, benefit to dwelling any longer in their case sure. um but but yeah size of organization could potentially slow them down or, or just how things are architected slows things down right like if they can't get the right access um then they might give up and say well we got this much we'll just encrypt this much and hope for the best you know like so i, I think sure. there's a give and take there um but yeah i mean the dwell time is still going to be when they either lose their patience or find what they want and it's just pretty much execute time right so yes. now in your mind with their ability to just partially encrypt the data, you really have to be, you know, kind of on the ball to look for those other behaviors that you were mentioning earlier, the lateral movement, the, you know, the, the internal scanning, the, the, the domain admin, you know, credential harvesting, right? That's, that's where you're going to find these people, not once they start to encrypt the data, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like that was like the big comment was like, oh, they're going to go under the radar because there won't be as many IO operations for what yeah. it takes to encrypt data. I'm like, really? If I'm detecting this with IO operations, I, I'm, yeah, I'm in for a world of hurt, you know? Right. Like, oh, there's slightly less IO operate. They only encrypted half of everything, but it's still not usable, right? Like, right. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, I wrote that down as a note. And I, I found that really interesting is that. You know, a lot of organizations are relying on machine learning, artificial intelligence. They're looking at anomaly detection with high spikes in CPU or RAM as you start to encrypt something. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting way to look for the thing. But like you said, it's too late at that point, right? Yeah, I've um, seen even like temperature. They'll, they'll monitor temperature spikes. Right. That was interesting. Right, right. Yeah. That might be good for detecting the thing that's happening already. But by that point, they've probably got their hooks into enough places where they're they're attacking you at that point, right? Um, yeah. You really need to catch them before they trigger that. So, again, tying this back to hunting, that's why we hunt for the behaviors, 
of those actors as it relates to your kind of your your infrastructure, you know, your your typical kind of enclave that good organizations as organizations mature should understand those points of of entry um, and movement. Right? Yeah, I really like so. Stuart was talking about how there, you know, there's a common extortion, right? That's what I really liked about the R clone stuff. It seems like we're seeing R clone used more and more and more. Yep. And there's a config file that specifically gets dropped with it that lets you just upload a mega file as part of that right off the bat. Um, so, so that mega file or mega IO, um, very common. Um, and then also the the comment where we fumble around and you know, well, they'll see them fumbling around and not really know what org they hit. I mean. It is yeah. kind of a smash and grab op. I mean, they, they are going to try to target organizations that have the most money because, you know, it's just better business for them. It's like robbing a bank versus a convenience store. Absolutely. But, but it's, I mean, it really is kind of like that criminal mindset of smash and grab because there, there hasn't really been much fallout for these people. So right. it, like misstepping isn't really a big problem. It's just like, oh, I didn't get my payday today. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and I, uh, I talked to a prospect this week and they were saying, you know, they see people get into their network and based on what they do at this organization, they leave immediately. They don't even want to touch this organization because it's not worth it to them, to your point earlier, yeah. to even try to attack. They might have got in and then they run away immediately, right? So they, they I guess they kind of know who they're messing with, right? It, you know, weird, weird uh, correlation to that, but it's like, John Wick, right? Like they stole that guy's car, they probably shouldn't have, right? And so you don't yeah. want to mess with an organization that has the ability to actually go do attribution and find you and prosecute you, right? So really interesting well, it's conversation. Similar, it's similar to when you see like the malware that looks for like the the OS language or keyboard right, type right, to right, like right. not target certain countries, right? Like, like the no hit list almost too. Yeah, I mean, we've seen that with Russia, right? So a lot of those state actors will will look for the keyboard uh, configuration or the language set and not even attack them. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but you know, it, 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 that's a pretty novel way to get around the the cost of encryption. Um, yeah. I think in the article it was saying, I guess Lockbit is utilizing this currently yeah well they mentioned lockbit was one of the fastest encryptors and they, right. they wouldn't be surprised that more and more uh of the ransomware groups pick it up yep. but you know what what makes me think of is um you know when people used to try to like just bring down hard drives in general like encryption for you know ransomware wasn't a thing mm -hmm. i mean the quick and dirty way was you know removing the master boot record right, right. and that's been in numerous denial of service attacks like they were more state sponsored just to knock people offline long enough to do what they need to do not really to like impact them fully but I mean, it was the quick win. It's like erase the whole hard drive or make it so the computer can't boot. I feel like yep. it's like a similar thing, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I think if you if you make it that the computer can't boot and you delete the master boot record, it's hard to ransom that out, right? You've already well, done yeah, that. that was purely <laughs> just to get in the right? way, right? The one fodder, yeah. And the, you know, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Um, no, awesome. I, you know, hopefully we don't see this in a while. But again, I think. The way you hunt for that type of thing, not looking at the actual event, but looking at the behavior around it is a really good way to approach these type of situations. Right. Um, and they use very similar techniques across all groups. So when you start, you know, mapping some of those common things, you know, we have collections that we create, you know, based on that. But we we see that and oftentimes they share them. And what's great is when one ransomware actor comes up with some novel way of doing something. Then they all start doing it so it, it yeah. really behooves people to like really figure that out or you know, what they can figure out and just kind of map it across absolutely so the next one we have i don't know if you're gonna pull up that article yeah i'll pull it up um good old log for j right um everybody's favorite exploit is back again um i guess this one is now targeting energy icsot type organizations um I have, this one was interesting. I mean, it popped. We did the internal scans to try to figure out if we were exploited. Luckily we weren't, um, but this type of exploit is is rooted so heavily into a lot of base capabilities of a lot of these applications, protocols, you know, Apache. This is uh, specifically exploiting uh, VMware Horizon, which we used to run back at a previous job. Um, so. What's interesting is that in, from an engineering perspective, 
especially with a, a an established organization like VMware and Horizon, I feel like this should have been patched by now, right? But I, I understand. Think patches, right? What's that? I think there's patches. It's just oh, more whether you patch or you put infrastructure into you know mitigate, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and they 100% put out a patch. Um, I would expect. I didn't do a lot of research, but understanding VMware, understanding how they approach this, I know they had patches out for ESXi, um, but you know, this might be a larger conversation around the kind of handcuffs that a lot of organizations have with, as far as patching and maintaining servers and you know upgrades to not lose um, reliability, especially if you're talking about energy providers. Um, yeah. But you know, Horizon is more of a you know a VDI type approach, right? So I feel like that should not have a core effect on the the energy reliability of those companies. So this one's really yeah, interesting. they're pretty good at they're pretty good. So you know, you know, people looked at my past experience. I did work at an energy company, and there's pretty good segmentation, right? Oh. Um, so so that initial foothold with this probably wouldn't land you on any control network. But it doesn't mean that if you dwell there long enough that maybe you can't find something depending on, you know, other sure. internal type controls, right? Sure. So that's the kind of like the scary thing is like, you know, the neglect there. And and that's what, you know, so with this, you know, I think of two things. One is Lazarus Group, right? North Korea. Um, and then who their targets are. So I'm always thinking like, well, what does North Korea care about? You know, they're grouping in US, Canada, Japan. Um, you know, what could be their motivations there? Then I start looking like, you know, geopolitical stuff. I didn't have the time to really dig into that too much, but, you know, sometimes you can actually see like the motivation drivers or, sure. you know, then over the next month or two, you see the motivation drivers of like, oh, so that's why they're really interested because these other things are happening, right? Right. Um, well, I, but I, the I good news is, go ahead. North Korea, I was going to say, I believe North Korea the past week said they established nuclear uh, power or energy. Okay. Yeah. Um, sustainable so i mean they, so that makes complete it, sense yeah it, it could just be information stealing ip stealing you know to try to catch up with these organizations that have nuclear power right so and that's exactly what they were kind of calling out was so like oh well, they're just going to be harvesting data like that's all they've done so far and, you know they weren't planning on doing anything other than that from what they've seen more the reconnaissance and and half the time it's worth it right that's that's yeah the idea. yeah and, you know, and then, you know, then the question comes Then if they want to do something, I mean, they learn a lot about these organizations and their processes and, you know, any intellectual property and stuff. But, you know, and then push comes to shove, they have information they may be able to leverage, too. So, you know, that's the risk there. But um, really, the one thing that I kind of took note when I was kind of digging into this was there's still a lot of hands on keyboard activity. So I remember when we were addressing the Log4j stuff, right? Yep. You know, we knew that if, if you find that something is vulnerable, there's ways to look to see if you're possibly hit. But really, the most important piece was what did post exploitation look like? Sure. Right. Right. Like, you know, OK, you know, because a vulnerability, just like anything else, there's like a million different ways that you're going to break into something eventually. But yeah. it's all those actions after that can become more consistent. Um, and so then it's not like this whack-a-mole type thing. And granted, when it comes to something like this, you, you find it and you patch it. That's like or you put some mitigating control in front of it. Sure. Um, but, but the one thing with the Lazarus group is they do a lot of hands-on keyboard with the stuff they do. Um, okay. so, you know, one of the things that is very common, it's, that it, um, is seen is, uh, they use PowerShell <coughs> and they use this a lot. Um, God, I, this image paste drop thing is just miserable. Um, they they do a lot of they you know so it's basically PowerShell doing exec bypass you know execute new object web client download string and it pulls down basically a your PowerShell script that wants to run um, so that's another way they kind of move some things um, and then since it's going to be pictures I'm just going to do this that what what's funny is this is like common amongst a lot of their breaches and this is activity we're all aware of um, right. Just standard reconnaissance. You know, we we look for this. Like, how often do we see these types of things happening within a, a duration of time? Um, and you know, it's just it's just funny because I feel like you know they get away with this type of activity, and us as defenders, we always focus on what is the really tough thing to solve. When a lot of times we're not forcing the actors to change their behaviors to try to do more creative things. Sometimes, um, 
And so these are the types of things that I think are the quick wins. Like, you know, for someone who might not have the experience to understand like how I'm gonna reverse this and then come up with this novel way to detect this, it's gonna be such a targeted detection or a targeted hunt or identification that when something like this, this is very basic that everyone can comprehend, those are really worth dialing in on and figuring out, you know, logical ways to apply those in your environment because at the end of the day, you see this once, you should be able to pivot off of these finds and then narrow down to, you know, those types of things. So um, that really stood out to me, right? You know, just the, the basic stuff, you know, you hear about these big energy companies getting hit from a nation state, but they're doing an activity that, you know, I think everyone should be capable of detecting, I guess. Now, this article came out recently. Um, I know CISA has new guidance on how quickly you should divulge information if you're being attacked. Do we know if this is a recent event or is this back when log for shell was really hitting and now we're just getting the information? Right. So I, I mean, kind of accused them of not doing yeah, the proper question. Update, right. So I'd be interested to see if this is this is an article that, you know, has happened recently or if this is something retrograde. It's that we're based on Talos's arg uh, article that was just September. Now, granted, I did okay. look at the article. I didn't look at the timestamps there. So it could have been, you know, a month or so back um, sure. for them to at least write it. So, but not so I would say relatively recent. Yeah. And so that brings up a point where, you know, you having worked in an energy company, you know how hard it is to bulk patch or update critical yep. systems. There's a lot of resistance, scared to break too. Right. Yeah. So if that's the case, I think there just needs to be some sort of communication between that engineering team or IT team and security team to say, look, we are still, and just own it. We're still vulnerable to this thing. Now, are there these, you know, targeted hunts or detections we can put in place to notify us to kind of have that quick response? Because we know the risk, because we know the threat. Now let's protect against that, right? Let's guard that, that hole in the defense, right? Um, and so I, I feel like that's a that's a really interesting way to just protect yourself long enough before you can put that upgrade in place where you kind of own that risk, right? Yeah, the I mean, to me, I always think of like there's the architectural, like what is it that's set up to where you feel uneasy about patching based on either redundancies, revert, reverting things or whatever, or architecturally where if you're scared to patch or touch something, what kind of things can you put in front of it you know, to kind of proxy whatever connections or, exactly. you know, fend off other other connections so that you buy yourself that latitude or you can do like what they call virtual patching, right? Yep. Um, so so there's, there's those considerations. But then sometimes I, I always worry that some teams and organizations get so siloed that who's responsible for finding the things to fix is very different from the team that's actually defending, that's different from the people that actually manage, right? And there's just not enough communication to where there might be a gap or someone missed something and miscommunicated something that if it was brought up appropriately, it would have been handled. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, so or, um, or they might have mitigated this risk saying, look, these horizon servers don't have access to any of the critical infrastructure right. at these companies. So that's not a priority at this place. Right. Right. Or they can put in some sort of firewall, you know, uh, firewall rules or some internal gating like you were mentioning to make sure that they don't have that pivot point and kind of silo that instance so yeah and at the end of the day you know you need to have, find those things have those conversations and then you know I, someone needs to sign off on i'm going to accept this for however long i'm going to accept this for right 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 and it shouldn't be the security team <laughs> so. absolutely not <laughs> yeah they have enough issues as it is right right uh, that, that's where you know third-party risk business risk the guys making a lot of money, the CISOs, the you know the top level managers have to you know own that process and understand the risk. Um, yeah, this, I mean it's still a little bit troublesome that you know this kind of happened with a very old exploit, but we're going to see this for years to come, right? Um, yeah, because it's not been in so many places, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so the next? let's do it. All right, so this next one was uh, the Bumblebee malware. They, you know, add some post-exploitation tool for stealthy infections. They're basically kind of figuring out ways to use tools that kind of already exist um, or have existed um, and just kind of changing a little bit of their techniques. So 
really the biggest takeaway I had, um, let's see, look at my notes, was one of the common things we've seen in a lot of instances are where there would be some sort of phishing type episode where an ISO or an image file, you know, will be sent, which when you then try to open it, it automatically mounts and inside a, a LNK or a shortcut file that has a target path that will actually execute something. Um, and the, one of the big differences we see here is they use a VHD. So it's a virtual hard disk. It's going to have the same functionality as those other types. Um, so similar technique, just found something where obviously as people learned about, you know, you don't expect to get ISOs or image files in, in your email, I, would, I wouldn't expect. So people start blocking these things. Well, they found another thing that might make it through. They can kind of keep this going. So an example, um, an example for what the old target um, command that was in that shortcut file looked like. This is an example of what one of those looked like, right? And man, it's always so bad. But basically, yeah. it's you know it's using CMD, right? Um, and then using the run DLL32 to basically pull in the payload it needs to pull in. Well, the new way or the new target, they're actually using PowerShell. So they're kind of switching a little bit, but I mean, we've seen these types of techniques being utilized. Um, so there's the example of the PowerShell one. Um, and and so that's, for me, the biggest way to detect this, right? It's the easiest. As you start getting into now things are running, it's trying to keep everything memory resident and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, there's some there's some cool analysis to understand how things work. So um, like an example of some of the stuff I saw was, when they run PowerShell, one of the common things that, uh, you know, attackers will do is they'll want to run PowerShell in a hidden window, um, which is basically, you know, the command, you know, dash window style hidden, right? But now there's a lot of tools that actually detect that. So they found a tricky way to basically execute it and it looked like this, um, which I thought was kind of cool. I haven't tested this, you know, I had to, um, deobfuscate this from an image. So there could be a typo or something in there, but this is basically what it looked like deobfuscated. So I'm at least close if it doesn't work. Um, but it basically is a way to invoke a hidden window without using hidden window in PowerShell. Um, so, you know, kind of tricky, right? Um, and, but and then the biggest thing was they, you know, did base 64 encoding, they then had gzip compression, and then that would invoke something where they had to do that same deobfuscation again with the base 64 and the gzip, you know, decompression. Um, and so the one thing, and I, I wasn't sure, but I'm pretty sure is, you know, one thing about obfuscation when it comes to PowerShell, when you have script block logging turned on, when things get executed, they kind of get deobfuscated and then get logged. Um, so a lot of times if you're looking for PowerShell specific detections, that script block logging, if you do collect it, um, can give you a lot of visibility. Um, so an example of what, you know, the pattern of that look like. Um, oh, yeah, and as you're posting that, I thought it was really interesting how they did the stream concatenation, basically building the, the commands, um, you know, parsing the strings out where they're saying has the equals ends and basically like building the actual command off yeah. of variables to, you know, to trick the detection mechanisms. I mean that's 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 great. <laughs> like that's a really novel way to do that. Yeah, that was like you know I my background and you know, I was computer science, but I never really did like software development or anything. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we got hit with like a payload light that was obfuscated like that. I was thinking like, God, I understand like what I'm looking at, but I don't understand how I'm going to piece this together. And it was right, literally right, right. like you know w walking the code literally, yeah. and it was the most mundane and eye soaring moment. Um, but it was really cool, right? And then you know yeah. when you and you know you get the right answer because it looks like something you expect to see. Sure. And it's never something complicated. It's not like that. What they obfuscate is like really you know aha moments. It's like oh they ran the very basic command after all it's, this. You know? It's literally just insert or remove in the in the example, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. So. So yeah, I think and, that's. Yeah, and 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 again with everything you're talking about here. Um, I kind of just want to always relate this back to threat hunting. Um, we're always going to run into actors who are going to game the system, basically, with this obfuscation, 
the Concat Nation. I, I think they understand security the same way we do, right? They wouldn't be doing this if they knew that they're putting in that they're not putting in the extra effort. They're basically right. like, we need to do this to be successful. So again, outside of looking for detections, looking for the actual base 64 encoded uh, string or those keywords as CASDA or the DBF, BDA type of variables, it's really looking at the the behaviors of, look, they're launching a virtual disk, right? That is probably very rare in an organization, um, mm -hmm. especially in the time span of a week or a month to have a large number of uh, users launching virtual disks, right? And so that's where we get into those behavior hunting. That could be the anomalous detection, but there's ways to get around this if you're looking in the right place. Um, there are ways to detect this if you're looking in the right place. Yeah, I always feel like with every attack, there's at least one easy thing that if you have the right visibility, you might not be able to detect 90% of it, but that one thing is all you need in some instances, just to have you look at the right place. Because a lot of the artifacts usually exist on the system, but it's not something you're central logging somewhere, right? Right. So then with some forensics and instant response type actions, you can validate really what you're looking for. And you mentioned the PowerShell script blocking. blocking. So that's a, I believe, a Windows audit capability uh, within yep. the Windows operating system. Um, and, and, and with your experience, how many EDR tools would log that kind of data? Now, are we missing that from an EDR perspective? I mean, you know. So I have seen, I have seen it, mm -hmm. but the, the one thing that I am not sure about when I've dug into some things was how much does it always catch? Sure. Right. And that's always my biggest question because I don't know how those tools work. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Like you, you kind of see the evidence of how these tools work sometimes. Sure. So the only way for me to like really, I had warm and fuzzy is I'd have to like throw a bunch of things at it. Um, but the biggest thing is I know with the script block logging in Windows, it works every time the power cells run. Right. Sure. Um, so that's where my confidence is and knowing that it's native and I understand how it's configured and I know what it's supposed to capture. Um, yeah. All I get from a lot of tools is just like an event type name. And I'm like, okay, it says it's getting this, but I'm hoping it's all there. Yep. But that'd be a lot of data too, based on everything else they capture. Sure. But it's important as we see here, right? It can glean a lot of information on these kind of attacks. And that's where I love uh, tools that don't just black box the data that they're pulling in or their detections. Like this is important for organizations to understand what we're actually logging. What does that visibility actually look like? And if you need to toggle that on or toggle that off or really dive in and define, you know, those those Windows event log type logs or registry keys that you're looking for. Because a lot of this matters as these techniques um, adapt and change over well, time. You need to be very specific, right? You bring up a good point, like, and it's always a frustration to me when it comes to some detection tools where we'll see a tool has detection for a certain attack. And then you wonder why all these groups use obfuscation, right? Well, it's because they found ways to execute the same attack, but not be detected by the tools. Right. And in some case, obfuscation isn't super complex. It's like, oh, if I add an extra space between here and here, it's enough to throw off the detection that now I'm not being seen. And if you were able, and you yourself can write a rule that will detect it in that same tool and account for those types of changes, and then it lets you know that, well, gosh, the some of the stuff being put into some of these tools just doesn't have the the breadth or muster to handle all the variations of the same attack. They're so targeted that yeah, today we got you protected because we heard about it. And until right. we see something different, yeah, so. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great point. Um, and we talked about, we talk about tradecraft, right? And these guys are putting a lot of effort into building their attack chain phase and their droppers and their stagers and the ability to call it the C2s. And once that gets caught, they're not really reinventing the wheel at that point. They're going and changing a little piece of the puzzle to obfuscate, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, if I'm using my remote control for my TV and I try to turn on and it doesn't turn on, I don't go out and buy a whole new TV 
for a whole new remote control, I change the batteries first, right? Like it's, it's those little fixes that allow you to be successful moving forward. Really weird metaphor, but hopefully that ties it in, right? Um, but those guys don't want to go change their whole skill craft and trade craft to affect that same attack. They're just going to manipulate the least amount of effort, right? Everybody's lazy. We all have habits. I'm going to do the least amount of effort to be successful, right? Um, we saw that with Emotech. Like we just tie into the Hunter platform. We just push a new update to Emotech, but this is probably the fourth or fifth time that we have basically recycled that hunt package or pulled it in and added more contextual intelligence because they keep changing that base 64 encryption or they change a little bit of how they are actually affecting those behaviors to get access to the environment. Right. Um, well, go ahead. Now I was going to say, I don't know if you want to jump to now our kind of discussion topics with uh, the left time, leftover time we have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we have... We have a real quick before we jump into that. We had a question from uh, Hack Lazy. Any resources for a window of events that we should be logging or filter out? Um, that's something we talk about internally a lot. Uh, and I, I think we have an internal process to start to gather our kind of best of breed for the Windows event logging, the audit logs. You know, Sysmon's a great open source tool for logging. Um, we hope to get that out very shortly. Basically, like Cyborg's guide to logging or guide to visibility. Um, and so we we use it internally in our lab. Um, we do talk to it, uh, talk with our customers as we onboard them about their visibility and what they're logging. But that's something that we're trying to get out to the world. Um, Scott, yeah, you yeah. So you know, off the hip, my just gut reaction is always like, all right. I would focus on Sysmon because it's really easy to configure what to log and what you don't want to log. Um, so then the stuff that you know that is noisy, that provides no value, you're not kind of paying that into your cost for resources and you know licensing for you know data collection. Um, except for obviously Sysmon doesn't do a lot of the um, access, right? right? So all your log on log off stuff like that. You rely on Windows for a lot of that. So. Sure. So there's that piece. Um, and I had another piece, of course, now that I'm on the spot, I'm going to go blank. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So one of the things that I liked, and I'll I have to find the resource and I can throw it in our Discord, but I did find where I got into research on the MITRE uh, mapping and then based on the detection side of that and then what logs were tied to those detections and like the cover down on a majority of the MITRE map, what um, field basically would you need to be able to do the best coverage from a data perspective yep. and interestingly enough it was the command line field if you're logging command line you were able to see the majority of the techniques um, now that being said miter is about techniques that have already happened so if new things come out it might not be there right sure. um but but yeah so you know that's that's something that you know to consider but the, some of the challenges, I think, when it comes to logging, like obviously we talk about just your, your host-based logging is the application. So when you have specific applications you're trying to protect, that's where it becomes a, you gotta learn your data and decide what you want. And it's never, don't fall down the path of, well, we'll get it all in now and we'll figure that out later because there is no figure it out later. Um, and then sometimes you kind of fall into that compliance bucket where if logging and visibility need, is needed, then you can't strip out the data because you're like, well, we're relying on you for the compliance checkbox to say that we record everything for so long. And then you're just stuck, but it impacts your operation, right? So right. so be careful and, of that. And I believe somebody posted uh, a little bit further up that they ran out of data for their SIM integration. And we see that all the time. We have customers talking about that today where you have these sims that charge by the EPS events per second. And it really limits you on what you can pull in. So then you have to prioritize it. Are you gonna pull in all your EDR logs? Are you gonna pull in your, your endpoint logs, your WAF logs, your network-based logs? And you have to kind of cut corners to you know, get the data and the visibility that you need. So, I think this is changing over time. I think the, the SIM space is starting to recognize that. I think the EDR space offering up cloud-based searching within their own environment, like CrowdStrike, for example, right? They're, they own the data source, right? Um, they own the logging and ingestion. 
they also have amazing visibility across all the organizations as well, right? So mm -hmm. there, there's a give and take to relying on another organization for that visibility and that logging, but it, it's it's still a give and take. It really is. It's a shame because I would love to log everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm a data, I'm a data junkie, so yeah. That's when it comes to like, hey, can I just give me data? I'll I'll just swim in it. I won't find anything half the time, but I'll just love to be around it and absolutely play with it and see what happens. You know, like it's yeah, cool. absolutely. Um, it, yeah, I I don't know. You know, I know there's organizations and a lot of people are moving to data lakes. Um, data oceans, I guess, is a new term now. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> data ponds, I don't know, uh, but it, they want to own their data, right? They want to not be beholden to another organization and ha basically be pay to play to get that visibility. So so I, um, we did something similar and I think the data lake thing is super cool. Um, but I really feel like if you want to go down that path, like don't just go into the investment just to store and house data. Like there's so much capability you can get with bigger data analysis and different ways like make that data interactable with other things if you're going to go the data lake strategy great way to store data you can possibly store it for a little cheaper because some solutions you can use you know lower end grade gear to get the right amount of storage and you get the you know distributed computing um but yeah but the you problem is strategy have, for that. yeah but 100 percent. i think the issue there is that you have call it a lar large organization that's rolling out a data lake, you'll probably have two, three, or four people that manage that data lake, the schema, the infrastructure, the data yep. coming in, and you get into an issue of uh, you know tribal knowledge where anybody else trying to come into that system, you get that like slap on the hand, like, no, nah, you can't mess with my data, it's my data, right? And you kind of get walled off from what you're talking about, that larger experience of, look, this is, this is something that everybody should be able to look at, manipulate, use, because there are different mindsets across the different organizations within the security operations center, IR, threat hunting, intelligence that you so need to utilize it. One of the great things, though, if you do house data like that, that I know a lot of people, or I, I don't know a lot of people, but I'm assuming a lot of people don't take advantage of, um, is when you do instant response or investigations, being able to associate the context of data to something else, that someone yeah, has the answer somewhere in some system, but it's not centralized in that way, that's where you can get some large gains with you know having everything, business data as well as other data kind of in something where you can kind of correlate, mismatch, pivot off of kind of thing, which is kind of cool, but a yeah. lot of planning, a lot of resources, <laughs> you know, yeah, not easy, but really cool. And that was the that was the whole concept of the sim, right? Uh, yeah, for security on. data, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was the whole concept. That was the dream early on. I remember when Splunk kind of just came out when I cut my teeth in cyber, and that was the net. It used to be like NetWitness, ArcSight, Splunk came out where they're saying correlate all your data, pull everything in, have that capability, but you know you only get ten thousand events per second or a thousand events per second, right? And then you have these large organizations, these financial institutes that are pumping a million EPS in, uh, you know, you run into some issues with the correlating of that data, so. Yeah, and you never want to impact search speeds. When yeah. you get to search for something and it takes 15 minutes, it's too long. Yep, absolutely. So I think that's um, a great pivot in. I know we have about, you know, 30 minutes left. Um, yeah. I think you could probably just take on one of the topics. So as we, you know, this podcast, we're still figuring out the format. We'd love the feedback. I think going over those net new articles is a great way to kick this off. And then we really try to touch on one or two topics that we define um, that are kind of interesting to us and threat hunting as a, you know, a space. So uh, the topic today is what makes threat hunting so effective, right? And I know that's a very top level, high level question to ask, um, but there, it's important. It's an important question. It's an important topic to talk about. I had a conversation this week again with a prospect that asked me, um, why should we care about threat hunting? Um, they were, I think there's a, a nomenclature issue, issue in cybersecurity where threat hunting from a human driven perspective is typically not talked about. 
I think threat hunting within the day space, you start to see the automated detections and alerts. And I just want to pump IP addresses through a SIM and see what fires, right? There, I think our whole goal and kind of our vision and our mission is to really drive home the value of human-driven proactive threat hunting um, and why it's important in these organizations. So, uh, you know, Scott, I'll, I'll kick it off to you as the resident yeah. owner. I just support you. So. <laughs> so it's funny. I was really introduced to what I think the true nature of threat hunting, like the concept, I want to say in 2016, right, where I actually worked with a group of guys that, you know, former NSA folk talked about, like, you know, how they thought of and introduced or worked threat hunting and the concept was like oh that's really cool you know like i, I like the idea couldn't wrap my head around like well what does that really mean um and so like i was excited about it i wanted to do it i didn't know what tools would, would best suit it kind of thing so i was expecting a tool to coincide with that not understand that it's, sure. it's better use of your tools you already have um and so um I wasn't sure if that really held water though, right? Like threat hunting, cool idea, does a whole water. I mean, the first thing I think at that same time is that's when the squirrel platform was coming out and like did threat hunting for you, you know? And I was like, oh, okay, that's what threat hunting is, right? Um, but, you know, something that's really cool, you know, especially doing this daily now with trying to find things and build things is, you know, we're getting to the point where we're seeing all these articles come out about this threat actor is doing this or the, you know this t attack occurred and instead of trying to develop something new we pull out all this information and we see that we already have something that already exists and that's kind of like to me what kind of made like it established that threat hunting actually works if you spend the time to do it um because now like I might only have to create one new thing and then just associate what already I could hunt on with whatever that attack is, that actor, and the work's kind of already done. The capabilities are already there. And so I feel like, you know, um, you know, it, I know there's some things you need to detect fast, right? Um, mm -hmm. But those things should be high fidelity things. Like when we talk about hunting, we're saying we see something unique and we need to look through a lot of data and then see what you know stacks itself out to say, oh, this is even more interesting. Let's dig further. A high fidelity make detections, right? Or maybe you can do some um, detections on some high-ish fidelity, but you need multiple things that are you know of that same caliber to say, all right, let's do something. But that stuff also should be fully automated. Once you build in enough testing and then you remove the fear of automation, if something has that high fidelity, like, hey, if this happens, it's bad, we do X. I mean, that should be scriptable. Hunting is where that now, instead of being that tool jockey, where you're waiting for the tool to tell you what to do, you can now use your people, your skills, your data to the max, right? And then use a tool how you want to use it um, and then see what gains you have there. So, you know, and then it, it kind of, when you look at an organization, um, if you have threat intel as a group, especially, right? Threat intel is going to feed things down and then it's supposed to get worked or hopefully they're feeding things that is at least operational enough. But um, when you have where you have a, enough hunt hunts built around activities, especially that are common activities and broad enough and not super targeted, then that threat intel, if you're able to feed that back up to them, then what would be a good exercise is now when they're doing threat intel, they can try to map what's there. And then there's just a validation. Hey, this looks like it covers this. Do we need to tweak anything, update anything? Now the workload becomes less, the value goes up. Um, and then the value is kind of shown just in that process, right? Um, so so that's something you know that I, I keep seeing almost weekly when I'm digging up things where I see the same things from completely different groups using the same techniques or, we have a way to detect, you know, variations of the same technique because um, we've gone through multiple iterations. And it's just really cool to really see it come together because, you know, I started out, like I said, I didn't know if I had enough confidence. I like the idea and something I thought was good to do, but I felt like an extra. I felt like, a, oh, if we have the resources and the time, yeah, that's what we would do. But your plate's always full in security. So then it was like, how do you really build that in and where do you get the value from it? So, yeah. Um... I think it was like 2012 or 13, um, you know, Dave, our founder, 
uh, back when he formed foreground security, the first company I worked for, kind of wrote a paper around threat hunting. So I've been kind of exposed to it very early on, and I've seen an iteration, like I was talking about earlier, of the concept of threat hunting. And to your point, it, because it was, if I have this extra time, I'll do it, but it's still important. Mm. I think a lot of product vendors started to latch on to that term and say, look, we'll just automate this process for you. Before automation and SOAR was really a thing, it was more like automated threat hunting, which was an easy, let's just run these searches, these IOCs, let's just hunt for the known knowns um, and flag you. So almost like early detection modeling or alerting. Um, but, and again, pulling experience from people I talked to, talked to somebody the other day and they just rolled out their SIM and turned it on. And he was like, look, we're a security team of two. I now have no time in my day because I'm right. triaging alerts all yeah. day. And I'm tuning my SIM and I'm tuning my detection logic and I'm having to like reintroduce myself to my organization and my environment to understand why these things are firing. Mm -hmm. how to tune those and they don't have time to do the threat hunting at this point but i think what we try to tell him and what i hope he understands is that all of that work he's doing now is going to make him a an amazing threat hunter in that environment a year from now because he's yeah, exposed to literally everything that he can yeah. be exposed to. um but again the problem with that is now all of that knowledge is stored with that one individual or that team um and it's hard to document when you're in the thick of things, right? Uh, documentation is a four letter word for most people, right? They don't have to write down what they're doing at the time. Um, a lot of times if I'm doing stuff on the server, I'll just hit the history, right? And then screenshot that out and that's my documentation, right? So um, it, people, you know, it's hard to uh, output that institutional knowledge. So that's where threat hunting comes into play where look like if you have that time in your day, Start digging into your environment. Start hunting for the things that you know these detections aren't firing against, or learn the anomalies and the behaviors that you should be seeing or that are popping up that you weren't expecting to see. Um, and that just gets into that ongoing iterative cycle of hunting. You're always kind of thinking in that manner if you're thinking about it the right way. Yeah, the one thing I was going to add when you were talking about like the tools that try to threaten for you. Yep. That was kind of around the time where I feel like it was a, a good thing in a weird way because I feel like when tools started saying they could do that, it just really meant they got really, really good at running queries across large sets of data. It was faster than most of the sims and tools that existed at that time. So it really pushed the technical envelope to be able to have the capabilities in a lot of ways to be able to do a lot with data or look across a lot of data you know, as, as opposed to time or, you know, accounting for time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's funny because I don't think that's the right method and I don't think you get the return with those types of things. But that, at that time, I feel like that pushed on because you see tools now that are, are blazing fast um, with some yep. of the things they can do. Yep, absolutely. And, and again, I, I'm talking about our vision and our mission and it's been interesting as we started this as a product company, really starting to understand that, look, um, I feel like there's not a lot of organizations out there trying to enable and help the actual analyst rather than just kind of supplementing what they do. So we're just going to automate this thing for you. Don't worry about it. We're going to detect this for you. Don't worry about what we're actually detecting. We're kind of black boxing it without exposing that data, that information, that human experience into that process, right? And that's really important to upskill, to train, to further advance these analysts that are dealing with these issues. Um, I think it's really important to kind of drive home that human interaction and involvement in all of this. And that's where threat hunting comes into play, right? Right. Well, it's kind of funny, it kind of drives us into our like next talking topic, right? Which is what does maturity and security mean to you? Even threat hunting, security or whatever, right? You know, we're, kind of we're kind of broaching that topic. so. Absolutely. I guess I'll open it up um, to you. When you think of maturity and security, what do you kind of, how do you evaluate that? Or what do you look for? Or, or what, what does that even make you think about um, before I jump in? That's a, that's a tough one, right? Um, you have 
I mean, we talked to organizations that has one IT guy that is also the security person. That's also the engineer. Yeah. Um, we have the largest banks in the world, in the country, that might only have a couple of threat hunters. They have all the tools in the world, but they're still inundated with the alerts, the detections, the process, the policies. I really think it's just understanding your current landscape and then putting in processes, protocols, procedures, have that as your base and grow into whatever you're trying to do, right? Um, if you understand the core of security and how to potentially, you know, uh, approach this from a, you know, bottom up approach where you're not trying to do everything at once, right? Um, my mentor coming up said, as soon as you turn on the SIM, I talked about this earlier, you're basically done, right? So have a plan in place to understand how to slow roll these security methodologies, these approaches out. So you're not trying to do everything at once. And I think once you have that in place, it affords you the time to do threat hunting, to do the more advanced purple team, blue team, red teaming exercises, um, grow an organization, uh, deflect from that attribution that typically happens in orgs where it's a fun place to work, right? Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's typically kind of how I look at it. I mean, you know, the smallest org in the world with two people still has a the gold nugget they need to protect, but they don't have the resources and the capabilities where they might be mature in their mindset, they might not be mature in their tooling and their process. It's kind of an ebb and flow, um, right. depending on the org. Yeah, so I've, I've seen a lot of different security operations, been able to tour and see a lot. Um, and mistakenly, I think, Every single time someone tries to portray their maturity or feel mature in the environment, they're just trying to measure capability. And I feel like there's an inherent flaw with that because then you run into some businesses that have the bankroll, they'll buy all the really expensive stuff because it adds more capabilities and now all of a sudden they feel mature. But as you were talking about maturity is not just about like your technical capabilities, it's what skills do you have, what processes do you have, the kind of people you have, the engagement you have, you know, in and outside of your security org. Um, so I, I just think it's interesting because I mean, like I go to some of these places and it's like, oh, look, it's an underwater lab in a secret location made of glass and neon lights. Wow, it looks amazing. Like I want to work there, right? But I yeah. feel like all they're doing is spending all this money to market to their leadership, to third party aud auditors and peers. And then also talented candidates to try and bring them in. And it's really just marketing, right? Like the cooler we can make it look, the more appealing we are. Um, so that, and all the really cool tools we have, we show all this capability. But when it comes down to it, it really should be measured in resiliency, right? Mm -hmm. Where if you were to rip a person out and have to replace them, how much um, does that hurt your operation, right? We all like I've worked I've worked so many places where there's like this key person where it's like, all right, well, all the run of the mill people can't figure it out. We'll give it to, to John over here. Yep. And yep. and he he's got it and he usually does, but when he's not there, that sounds like a pretty big gap, right? Yeah. Not very resilient. But the same thing with technology. You know, you have this these really cool tools and then what, what happens is your budget changes and you have to remove a tool. You can't say, Well, now we can't do security anymore. Right. Um and then a lot of technology too is so like I you want I'm gonna misuse this term because I know that's not what monolithic really means. But a lot of tools, instead of like focusing on something and being really, really good at it, they're usually like really good at one thing, but they have all these other things that come with it. So when you buy it from a budget purchasing perspective, it's like, well, you have these five capabilities, like, well, we only want it for this one, because these other four, they do, but not as well as these other things, right? Stock in the box, right? Like these organizations yeah. that are selling literally everything, like buy this, yeah. you get EDR, XDR, NDR, uh, attack service management, yep. like it, yeah. And the, the big thing I I have seen, or I, I've made strides with, with when I was in security operations, where we didn't have the, to have the best product. Almost like if you got a medium range product that you were confident did really well, but it was able to integrate with your other products really well, man, it was so, you almost got so much more capability because now you have like a, a basic um, architecture where everything works together and you get the best of all worlds 
um, and you don't have to like pivot to different places, right? Like it's all, in, it's like one big mind, right? You almost build that monolithic, I have this one solution, one stop shop, but by bringing them together, you create your really resilient processes. Now your technology, you can kind of plug and play different things in there. You might lose some edge things, but you're able to plug something in and it fills the gap much easier, right? And then processes, gosh, the one of the painful things when it comes to like maturity and processes, I've either seen where processes contradict each other, right? Where you, you right. Have to do this one thing, but then this other process is kind of like going backwards or actually hurting something. Or you have processes you follow that you, everyone in, that does the process is like, why are we doing these? And there's <laughs> right. no one there to rip those out. Um, those are bad, right? Time is so valuable. Um, and then engagement. Like if you have a security organization that can't talk to HR, legal, other groups openly about topics, about situations, you know, when you do tabletops and run and run through things and they're not included at the table, you know, that's 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 a gap as far as maturity goes, because when the really big things happen, you're not gonna be able to solve those with inside your four walls, right? I think that's um, a really good point to expand maturity outside of just the security operations center. It's the whole org. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we talk about security training the you know no befores and you know the the organizations that do security training but you're basically siloing let's call it the hr department saying look you got to do this week worth of security training but that's all literally we're going to talk to you about security for the right. whole year like, good luck right um it'd be interesting to i think somebody talked about tabletops in the, the discord bring them into those exercises right uh, allow them to see what actually goes into that process if you have to record it and keep it internally, but I think to that point, Scott, and that's a really interesting opportunity is to expose everybody to the the day-to-day -day of the fight that security has to do from a policy, procedure, IT department, engineering, you know, all of that allows those other people to do their job. So when they complain about, I can't plug an USB into my computer, talk about that, explain that, like, get a little bit more visceral around why we do those type of things rather than so, saying you can do it. Something that I think is, you know, I, I love tabletops and I know it's really good to test processes, but you know, when people do pen tests and things like that, um, I really feel like it's good to have that same engagement because I don't know how many times where when you investigate something, that you find and obviously if you're doing a pen test and you know you're doing a pen test you're looking for things you're going to find some things some of the actions you want to take you either don't have the access the visibility or whatever and it's something you may have complained about over and under you know how many times um but when people are able to see that as part of that tabletop when there's some technical um components working in play like what would you do here how would you address this and they see those as hurdles it creates a visibility to the right people that say, well, this doesn't make sense. Why, why can't these people do that? Like they, they need this to do their job right. and it's able to remove those hurdles, but create the common vision of like why people are here and what is it they actually do? Cause I'll be honest, a lot of people, when they think of security, they're like, they really think of it, how really immature security places are where you're waiting for an alert to tell you to go investigate something. And then you just go delete it, you know, at the <laughs> layman's terms, right? Like, Hey, I found the virus. I deleted the virus or yep. remove the device from the network, we're good. And security instances are way more complex than that in some aspects, so. Yeah, absolutely. And that used to be the 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 way we talked about security in IR, uh, call it five, six years ago. It's like, you know, isolate from the network, re-image the hard drive or whatever, and then put it back on the network, right? Um, there's a lot more steps that go into play there that I think, again, to this topic, drive the maturity of an organization well, what's but, good for that scenario is ransomware. How are you going to remove that and reimage it to fix the issue? You know, it's right, like... right, right, right. <laughs> and then the elephant in the room is budget, right? Like, I think budget drives maturity. If you don't have the ability to hire and build and grow naturally within an organization, you're going to be behind from a maturity perspective, right? And so I think we always see cybersecurity as that, like, it's a nice to have from a budget perspective until something bad happens and then we're going to throw you a bunch of budget and then we're going to take it away in a couple of years because <laughs> there's no risk anymore like we haven't been hacked in three years so let's start to you know decrease budget or keep it the same 
right? Um, I, I think there needs to be a growth model in place there as well to track, you know, uh, inflation, right? As things get more expensive, you need to increase that budget to keep the lights on, basically. For the so security. something to be said there, like like I said, I like to try to measure maturity based on resiliency. Mm -hmm. Is not enough investments going into people, right? So when you think about a secure, when you think about processes and technologies and integrations between technologies and all these things, all these things are created or implemented with people. And so there should be a bigger emphasis on how we're investing and growing our people, incorporating our people in this, because if you have this dream for this really secure, efficient machine, you need people to do it. Um, and the people with the right skills and everything. So yeah, that's something that's commonly like people think they can, re organizations feel they can replace people with technology. And that's not really the case. You can't replace, you can't put a hammer, buy an additional hammer and get rid of the carpenter, right? Just yeah, work that way. I, coming from the source space, um, working there for three and a half years, I know when we went in to deploy the product, um people got very worried that we we're trying to place their analysts and we're like no 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 we're just trying to free up their time to do the more important tasks and really the the big selling value in the internal investment there is that we're retaining the institutional knowledge and the process and the the ability for you to you know affect change and give time back to those analysts so they enjoy working at that organization so they're not they don't have a pager on, they have to go to the, this used to be my life where I, I would go to a movie, but have my computer in the car in case something blew up, right? Like that's not a fun way to live. So 100% uh, Scott, I think I think the people is the biggest piece of this. And how do you set up an environment where they're happy, you know, they're learning, they're growing their career, um, they're, they're building on the things that they love to do. Um, and that just comes into the maturity of the process and the policies that you put in place. So I want to comment on JW when he talked about the deleting the virus, but you don't know what it did. That's like one of the banes of my existence working in security operations is how everyone feels so comfortable when when technology identifies something and it says it's handled. But then when yeah. you actually look at something, it's like attacks are more complex than a single file sometimes. <laughs> so it might've caught a piece of it, but it didn't really stop anything. Um, that's something that, you know, I think there's a, a huge miss as far as understanding goes from a security, from young security folk, because I feel like that's what's being taught in academia in some aspects, right? Like they're not getting the knowledge early enough to understand how things work in that regard, but then also communicate that organization when they see a virus pop up and they see it was deleted. A lot of times people aren't going to tell the security staff that, Hey, I got this pop up, you know, if somehow they weren't getting alerted in their security operations center. Um, right. that, hey, you know, and these are things that, you know, are just poor understanding, but I like the comment because I've seen that, I don't know how many times. Yep, yep, yep. Um, yeah, I was talking to uh, a relative of mine this week about a potential phishing. Um, and I think there was a, a hesitance to forward that over to the ID department because that was going to be this whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, I think that happens everywhere where it's like, man, I don't want to get involved with this crap, right? Like, let let's just delete it and move on. Like, I I don't want to have the hassle. Um, and you're worried you did something wrong. You don't want to get in trouble too, and that's exactly, not exactly you know, right, right, yeah. 100. Um, but I, you know, I think we're coming up on that the 30 minute mark uh, past the hour. Um, we got. So you do the drink introduction of what uh, what we're drinking tonight. I think it's I think it's TBD for the next episode. No, but what I, I don't think we talked oh, about the recipe. That's that right. We're drinking. Yeah. 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 So I actually um I'm drinking straight whiskey right now. Uh, Scott has <laughs> the DDoS oh. DDoS daiquiri is what we called it. So we're trying to get a little uh, witty with the names of the liquor and alcohol that we're drinking through this. Um, we we share out the recipe ahead of the podcast to let everybody else kind of enjoy it with us. It just got posted in the discord. Uh, Scott added a little bit extra to it. If you want to talk about it. Yeah. So I, I, I like to grow really hot peppers. So I had a mustard ghost pepper um, that I put some in there and it went really well with the mango. Um, but it's funny because I didn't taste most of it. 
until now I'm at the bottom and now it's really getting hot. And uh, so it must have settled as we've been hit. And so it's probably good <laughs> that we're wrapping this up because talking might not be so easy here in a minute. But <laughs> right. um, Lips going numb. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you have any suggestions for a, a, a witty cybersecurity themed name for a drink, we'll try to figure it out and, and throw it into the next cast. Um, one announcement I want to make is that we're actually doing a workshop October 5th at 12 o'clock. We'll be posting it out on LinkedIn. Uh, we're covering the MITRE tactic of execution. We actually have a badge available if you join us on the workshop. You'll get your execution badge. The really, really cool thing about these workshops is, is that we will supply the people with a, a way to do the workshop with us, right? And so um, we want to make this interactive. This is literally just, you know, diving into the hunting process. Um, uh, there'll be more information about how to get access, how to join the, the podcast, or, excuse me, the workshop. Um, uh, we just posted in the Discord, but looking forward to it um the last workshop we did amazing turnout really good feedback again we're really trying to drive the community and preach threat hunting um but enjoyed so, this podcast number two in the books what's up scott so one thing to add is in the workshop expect we will be walking through some of those hunts focus on execution but then the get the badge it's kind of like it captures a flag where you're going to look for other modes of execution and find those and turn those in to get the badge. So, you know, for people that like little challenges and they're not going to be super hard because we're making beginner type workshops um, to start out, but we're going to start raising the bar as we you know, mature that whole process. Um, but uh, yeah, it should be a lot of fun. So definitely yeah. check it out. Yeah. Number two in the book, Scott. Down a man. Uh, right I think we're going to try to plan the next one um, probably a month out, but let us know. Give us the feedback. We're trying to grow this thing. Um, it's been fun talking, just kind of letting our hair down, so to speak. Uh, yeah, talking about <laughs> yeah, no <kidding. laughs> uh, the Bald Guy podcast. I think we need to rename mm -hmm. it. But um, really appreciate the attendance. Um, again, you can find us on Apple Music, everywhere you can get podcasts. Um, but yeah, give us the feedback. We're gonna try to grow this thing out. So thanks yeah, for everybody. ideas are good. Any ideas people have, please share because we we want to make this more fun for everybody. Yep. Absolutely. Well, all right, let's go uh, drink some more, I guess. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. All right. Everyone take care. Take care, guys.